Hello! I am so very happy to welcome you to the first episode of The Vorecast, a podcast about Lois McMaster Bujold's Vorkosiverse. My name is Daniel Galsworth, and I will be your guide, slash narrator, slash commentator, slash navigator through the wormhole nexus of this sci-fi universe. That line sounds worse every time I read it. Okay. If you're still with me, in this premiere episode of The Vorecast, I will take some time to introduce myself and my reasons for creating this show. I will read through a short autobiography by Lois McMaster Bujold herself. I will briefly discuss the format of future episodes, and I will begin my breakdown of the first installment in the Four Crossover series, the short story, Dreamweaver's Dilemma. Once again, my name is Daniel Galsworth. Uh, I was born in 1981, making me 40 years old at the moment. I grew up in New Jersey. I went to the College of Santa Fe in New Mexico, where I studied film production with an eye on becoming a director. Due to my poor grades, it is possible to fail out of art school, and the fact that I had already started working on film productions that came through New Mexico, I dropped out of college, moved to LA, and began a five-year-long stint working in film and television production. Mostly I worked in the camera department, hauling film, video, and lighting equipment around, and logging footage. The reason I am going into any detail regarding my film and television career is that I hope this life experience will serve as some kind of credential lending my opinion on the highly subjective topic of art a little weight. After attending a dinner party at a geodesic dome where a bunch of JPL engineers lived, I had a profound insight into my own life's trajectory. As I was talking with these JPL guys, all mechanical engineers, the seed of an idea was planted and that idea was in something like this. These guys don't seem any smarter than me. Was I really bad at math in high school or did I just not have any motivation to learn it? Soon after, I enrolled in Los Angeles City College for context the Dan Harmon show Community was being filmed there as I was attending, and tested into pre-algebra. Six years later, I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering from Cal Poly Pomona, and since I have worked uh, in industrial automation controls. During the second run at a bachelor's degree, as part of my general ed curriculum, I took two English classes focused on the sci-fi or speculative fiction genre for which uh, I received A's. While I took these classes roughly a decade ago, I do remember most of the concepts that were discussed, and I am sure I will be referencing them throughout the series. The reason I'm going into detail regarding my second career as an engineer is that I hope this experience will serve as a credential lending my opinion on topics of practicality and realism of sci-fi tech we will be encountering in this series some weight. In summary, on the Vorecast, you can look forward to criticism and analysis of the Vorkorsigan series, which has been informed by formal study and practical application in both the fields of storytelling and engineering. I would also like to take this opportunity to give you all a little background on my personal history and taste with the sci-fi genre. Not only is this an aggressive act of self-indulgence, but I also hope that this will give you all a reference level or calibration of what I generally think is good and bad media content. In early memories, I am always most excited for the Muppets in Space segment of The Muppet Show. My mom and I are watching and loving Star Trek The Next Generation and later The X-Files. My aunt blowing my mind when she told me it was pronounced Darth Vader and not Dark Vader. Watching Spaceballs countless times. Colonel Sanders, the first line of that movie. Being really excited and then ultimately disappointed for the teased Jews in Space movie at the end of History of the World Part 1. I was too young to get the joke. Then as a slightly older child, discovering the video store, The Terminator. I began to realize that most kids my age, maybe not at the time, had never heard of movies like The Terminator or Aliens or Predator or, my guilty pleasure, John claude Van Damme's Cyborg. I remember having to explain the plot of The Terminator to a group of confused-looking children after my attempt to get everyone to play Terminator on the playground during recess fell flat. I began to realize that I was developing a deep interest in what would become known as a subculture. I would soon find out that the road down which interests in sci-fi, fantasy, and horror led was away from the mainstream and was, therefore, a lonely road. I think I switched tenses somehow. 
during that last sentence, but we're going to continue pushing forward. That was what made meeting fellow travelers all the more exciting. Man, I got to be easier on myself in future scripts here. Okay. You have to remember that before the internet, geek culture was not cool in any mainstream sense. The first inklings that these subcultures could be developed into serious markets began just as my teenage years were ending. Image Comics, the first successful superhero movies like X-Men and Spider-Man came out. High concept science fiction proved it could have mass appeal with The Matrix. The Lord of the Rings trilogy finally gave serious artistic credibility to the fantasy genre, which is a sentiment nobody would have ever dreamed to connect with Peter Jackson at the time. Please watch Meet the Feebles if you haven't. The cultural influencers of the time were marketing companies working for multimedia conglomerates, not social media marketing companies working for multimedia conglomerates like today. It's a big difference. I believe there was a concerted effort to mainstream these subcultures because they represented hardcore and loyal fan bases, desperate for content and positive social recognition, and ripe for exploitation. When I was 11, 1992, I was shown Akira by my babysitter who had it on VHS somehow. As my babysitter explained, nobody in the U.S. knew about this genre of animation. While not surprisingly, I was totally... While... Okay, here we go. I put a comma in here for some reason. Okay. While... And then, I guess this is an aside. While, not surprisingly, I was totally confused by the plot of the film, I did understand that this would be yet another thing I loved that most people did not or even want to know about. Later, I remember that Japanimation, as it was called then, had an even earlier influence on me, and that I had subconsciously matched the idiosyncratic Japanese animation style of Akira to the vague memories of renting a, in quotes, cartoon as a seven or eight-year-old that had shockingly adult themes and content. I absorbed these confusing concepts and semi-traumatizing images into my tiny brain over several repeated unsupervised viewings. This film turned out to be The Dagger of Kamui, uh, although I could have sworn it had a different title back then. I also have another distant memory uh, about a space train and a guy with giant collars and, and an eye patch. but back to sci-fi. Uh, oh, and I also want to point out that at some point I also rented the, the uh, Ralph Bakshi movie Wizards uh, animated film, also probably <laughs> miscategorized as a cartoon and put in the ch children's section <laughs> at, at the uh, little video store, independent video store I used to go to uh, before Blockbuster came to town. Okay, nonstop tragedy. I hated reading as a child. And I'm no longer ashamed to tell you that I didn't complete my first book until sophomore year in high school. What was it? What genre? It was George Orwell's 1984. I don't need to go into details about why this book was and is still amazing and important for everybody to read. What was more important to me at the time than the content of the book was that this was the first time I had experienced the loss of self inside of a written story. The first time my imagination had been guided by an author to create mental representations of people and places that existed only in my mind. This book opened my mind to the joys of reading, as corny as that sounds. Another aside, I guess. Uh, uh, you, me, you, you, me, guys, were in on the joke about how corny I am, right? Okay, which uh, up to that point in my life was an activity I only associated with anxiety, restlessness, and intimidation. Reading. I'm still talking about reading. I still read books, but if the book I'm interested in reading is available in audio format, I will always go that route. In fact, before I read 1984 with my eyes, I had already listened to many books and had fallen in love with the audiobook format. The only problem is that audiobooks are super expensive. But did you know that there are audiobooks available from the public library? When I found this out, I was living in L.A. and had access to an enormous system of libraries and physical audiobooks on CD and even cassette tape. And for newer titles, popular titles, available directly to download for free. Over the 11 years I lived in L.A., I sampled and burned through authors' catalogs like a... Oh, here we go. Here's a, here's a Stephen King reference. Okay, let's back up. Over the 11 years I lived in L.A., I sampled and burned through author's catalogs like a G.D. Langelier. And I wrote G.D. in abbreviations. A G.D. Langelier. Falling in love with classics of the genre, 
like Heinlein, Clark, Sagan, Herbert, although I struggled with Asimov. Modern masters like Carr, uh, the Bean series, way better than the Ender series. I don't know, is that a hot take? Um, uh, Niven, Simons, uh, Simmons, excuse me, Adams, Steakley, Armor, so good, and so is Vampires, if you haven't read those books. So one's called Armor, one's called Vampires. Uh, they made a terrible film added to adaptation of the Vampires. Was it terrible? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, anyway, um, it was during this time that I, after years of dismissing this ser series, now, now I'm talking about the Vorkosigan series on audiobook, after years of dismissing the series as too long and the cover art too corny, began my first steps into Lois McMaster Bujold's Vorkosiverse after seeing it on an internet list of best space opera series. I started with Shards of Honor and was hooked. And in case you're wondering what I'm reading right now, I am most impressed with children with the Children of Time series by Adrian Tchaikovsky. Wow, I've actually never read that name aloud. Wow, did I nail it first try? He's an amazing writer, and I would also recommend his Ironclads as a super fun mech armored suit genre novella. Uh, I do have, I'm partial to that kind of stuff. Uh, I'll, I will admit it. And I'm proud of it. Uh, all I can say is, wow, read them. Okay. <laughs> Another great series I just finished, which totally look, took me by surprise and, interestingly, deals with some of the same passing of long time span time concepts as Children of Time, is the Rage War series by Tim Lebon. Yeah, uh, this is actually an alien versus predator lore <laughs> series, and it is fucking great. Um, and I, of course, yeah, I do love Alien vs. Predator, or Alien and Predator, uh, you know, just as characters, but, you know, they're, the content surrounding them has never really been that good, uh, besides the first movie or first, you know, a, a Predator 2, I, I still think is fine. Anyway, continuing on, I believe I listened to all three books in this series on YouTube for free. The story takes place in... Oh, look, see, now I'm backtracking. I've even backtrack, backtracked uh, in my script here. Okay, so let's, let's stick to the script then. The story takes place in the Alien vs. Predator universe. I know, pretty lowbrow stuff, but the characters and plot are great. There are so many interesting sci-fi concepts explored in the series, as well as building the AVP universe in a very compelling direction, maybe for the first time. The alien and predator action is fun, the stakes seem real, the threats are taken seriously and dealt with intelligently by the characters. So important. This was a real pleasant surprise, and I would recommend it to the snootiest of readers. Also, the voice acting is great, and I love the way one of the characters says the proper name for the predator species. He's got, like, a southern accent for some reason, even though this is the far future. A slight gripe, but whatever. He goes, Yaucha! <laughs> um, Yaucha! So, yeah. Great, great, great series. So, now let's uh, get back to the topic of the podcast. Uh, it looks like I've been talking for almost 15 minutes now, and uh, maybe we should actually start <laughs> the podcast. Stop talking about me, right? How will the forecast work, you ask? You ask? Do you ask? Are you asking? Starting with the short story, Dreamweaver's Dilemma, which, according to Dendari.com, and now I'm going to start referring to Lois McMaster Bujold as LMB. Uh, I don't know, maybe... I've never seen anyone talk to reference her like that. Maybe she doesn't like it. Uh, and until I hear otherwise, that's what I'm going to do. LMB's official and... All right, so let's backtrack. Starting with the short story, Dreamweaver's Dilemma, which, according to Dendari.com, LMB's official and authorized website, is the first installment of the Vorkosian series. I will be reading in its, referring to the series, internal chronological order, which is also specified on that website. Interesting, if you click through to LMB's personal suggested reading order, Dreamweaver's Dilemma is not included at all. And, uh, I don't know, I feel like saying harumph or something. Um, or like, aha! But, I mean, what am I, did I catch someone doing something? I don't know. I am including it in this series both for reasons of completion and because, fascinatingly, Dreamweaver's Dilemma was the, fir was the very first thing that I wrote as... An attempt... Oh, look, I'm... No, I just broke into a quote here. Oh, come on, man. Dream... As this is a quote. This is LMB. Um, Dreamweaver's Dilemma was the very first thing that I wrote as an attempt at 
a professional story as an adult, not counting all the things I did back in high school and college, end quote. This quote comes from the answers section included in the Dreamweaver's Dilemma collection of short stories and essays. So they, I don't know if it's in a Q&A format uh, section called Answers. For this reason, I think it is absolutely necessary to start with the short story written in 1982, as I hope it will offer insight into LMB's development as a writer. I will be making an effort not to spoil future events in the series as I read through earlier books, but I will likely point out people, places, themes, and concepts that shouldn't be noted for later reference. I will be aiming to keep each episode around the hour mark and will be taking my time working through each novel and short story. Each installment in the series will likely need three, four, or maybe five podcasts to break down. Depending on feedback, both episode length and number of episodes given to each short story may change. For primary sources on the Vorkosaverse, I have the Dreamweaver's Dilemma collection edited by Sue Ford Lewis. I, I hope that's Sue Ford. I'm sorry, I hope that's how you say your name. As well as the Vorkosigan Companion, edited by Lillian Stewart Carl and John Hulfers. Both of these collections contain extensive reference materials, including maps, lineages, timelines, and even pronunciation guides. Even more than that, they both also include essays by the author and many others that should give all of us some serious insight into LMB's epic work. I plan on producing special episodes of the Vorecast discussing these essays as well as having special guests on from time to time. I will also be referencing Dindari.com. And uh, in case you're wondering, that's spelled D-E-N-D-A-R-I-I.com. Okay, so I would like to take a few minutes to read a biolog, as she puts it, written by LMB. A version of this is printed in Dreamweaver's Dilemma, but the version from Dendari.com seems to have been more recently updated. This is Dendari.com, the Bujold Nexus. Biolog, Lois McMaster Bujold, updated 21 September 2004. With a lovely photo. I was born in Columbus, Ohio in 1949. I graduated from Upper Arlington High School in 1967 and attended Ohio State University from 1968 to 1972. I have two children, Anne, born in 1979, and Paul, born in 1981. We resided in Marion, Ohio from 1980 to 1995 and moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1995. I have been a voracious reader all my life, Beginning with a passion for horse, for horse stories in grade school, uh, I imagine uh, she's referring to like, uh, you know, the, the what was it called, Black Beauty or something. Oh, geez, what were those books called? Anyway, I began reading adult science fiction when I was nine. Oh, see, similar to me, adult science fiction films when I was nine. I began reading adult science fiction when I was nine. A taste picked up from my father. He was a professor of welding engineering at Ohio State and an old Caltech man, PhDs in physics and electrical engineering, magna cum laude in 1944. Whoop, whoop, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's before they had to do much uh, transistor and, well, whatever. I don't need to defend my GPA to you people. Okay. Uh, uh, and used to buy the science fiction magazines and paperback books to read on the plane on consulting trips. These naturally fell to me. My reading taste later expanded to include history, mystery, romance, travel, war, poetry, etc. My early writing efforts began in junior high school. By 8th grade, I was putting out fragmentary imitations of my favorite writers, uh, on my own time, of course, not for any class. My best friend Lillian Stewart and I collaborated on an extended storyline throughout high school. Again, only a fragment of the uh, total was written out. The high point in my high school years was a summer in Europe at age 15, hitchhiking with my older brother. Yeah, that does sound awesome. I dabbled with English as a major in, ho- in college, uh, but quickly fell away from it. My heart was in the creative, not the critical end of things. Oh, see? Yeah. <sighs> I just love criticizing, though. But an interest in wildlife and close-up photography led me on a six-week biology study tour in a- East Africa. 800 slides of bugs, semicolon. Much later, I also borrowed the landscape in ecology I had seen as backgrounds for my first novel. Oh, okay. That's one of the nicest things about writing. All of a sudden, nothing is wasted. Even one's failures are reclassified as raw material. 
After college, I worked as a pharmacy technician at Ohio State University Hospitals until I quit to start my family. This was a fallow time for writing, except for Sherlock Holmes' pastiche that ran about... Oh, pastiche. Oh, look at that. Another time reading that out loud. First time out loud. Oh, okay. Another time, uh, except for Sherlock Holmes' pastiche that ran about 60 pages. It was, however, a very fruitful time for reading. As my staff card admitted me to OSU's 2 million volume main stacks filled with wonders and obscurities. Then my old friend, Lillian Stewart Carl, the editor of the Lacosa Companion, turns out, began writing again, making her first sales. About this time, it occurred to me that if she could do it, I could do it too. I was unemployed with two small children, note oxymoron, uh, on a very straightened budget uh, in Marion. Sh straightened? Straightened? Budget in Marion at this point, but the hobby required no initial monetary investment. Very true. I wrote a novel, unlike podcast. I wrote a, no, a, <laughs> I wrote a no, novelette for practice, then embarked on my first novel with help and encouragement from Lillian and Patricia C. Wow, Ray, Raid, W R E D E. I don't know how you say that. A fantasy writer from Minneapolis. I quickly discovered that writing was far too demanding and draining to justify as a hobby and that only serious professional recognition would satisfy me. Interesting. Whatever had to be done in terms of writing, rewriting, cutting, editorial, analysis, and trying again, I was determined to learn to do. This was an immensely fruitful period in my growth as a writer, all of it invisible to the outside observer. Oh, how cool. My first novel, Shards of Honor, was completed in 1983, the second, The Warrior's Apprentice, in 1984, and the third, Ethan of Athos, in 1985. As each came off the boards to begin the painfully slow process of submission to New York publishers, I also wrote a few short stories, which I began circulating to the magazine market. In late 1984, the third of these sold to Twilight Zone magazine. My first professional sale, yay! This thin proof of my professional status had to stretch until October of 1985 when all three completed novels were bought by Bean Books. Thank you, Bean Books. They were published as original paperbacks in June, August, and December of 1986, leading the uninitiated to imagine that I wrote a book every three months. Analog Magazine serialized my fourth novel, Falling Free, which is the novel we'll be reading after uh, Dream Reaper's Dilemma, in the winter of... 1987-88. It went on to win my first new Nebula. I was particularly pleased to be featured in Analog, my late father's favorite magazine. Oh, wow, look at that. Closure. I still have the check stub from the gift subscription my father bought me when I was 13, a year for $4. The Mountains of Mourning also appeared in Analog, went on to win both Hugo and Nebula awards for Best Novella in 1989. The Vor Game and Barry R. won Hugo's for the best novel back in 1991 and 92. My titles have been translated into 19 languages so far. Sample chapters, blah, blah, blah. Okay, Mountains of Morning, New Fantasy, Cursed. Okay, it's blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's about it. I guess we can wrap it up there. We don't need to read through all the accolades. Okay, back to the script. Well, I mean, you can see the difference in quality of writers, right? You see how easily I, I read through her uh, writing, whereas I can't. I trip over my own writing, uh, and, and 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 that was even sans serif uh, on some kind of horrible background. It was even hard to read. Like the font color was almost the same color as the background. Okay, well, um, so I'm sorry to say. Before we get to the first story, I would like to read a selection from a review written by uh, Annalee Newitz in 2016 for. Okay, here we go. Arstechnica. Arstechnica.com. A-R-S-T-E-C-H-N-I-C-A.com. Titled, Time to Try the Verkosigan Saga. You've never read science fiction like this. I don't know, I felt like a freeze frame right there. Here's an excerpt. Uh, and, I, and the reason I selected this because uh, I really felt it summed up uh, very well how I felt about this uh, series and about uh, LMB's uh, writing. And um, yeah, it's just... So, here we go. Always witty and masterfully plotted, the Verkosican Saga's novels chart the rise of a powerful family whose members are enlightened and humane, 
though not above breaking the law or bargaining with shady characters when necessary. Through over a dozen books and many more short stories, the series has lasting appeal because it doesn't shy away from complexity of political engagement, whether that's in wars over wormholes or in the halls of a sketchy cryogenic storage clinic. Bujol never forgets about the personal realm either, giving us characters whose lives definitely remind us that soap opera and space opera have a common, uh, have more in common than the word opera. Well, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't quite lessen this story to the realm of soap opera, but anyway. Okay, so so yeah, that, that what I wanted to really point out is she never forgets the personal realm. That yeah, that and and, and as we go through, we'll we'll see that that these these all these characters are so real. And and she ne- she never shies away from even what could be like the most embarrassing kind of insight, you know, uh, uh, of to what makes a person person. And, and 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 yet she approaches these things and she manages to maintain a levity and and even in the most darkest moments of the series. Anyway, oop. Drop my iPad. Okay. All right. So finally, let us begin our official first breakdown of the first part of the Vorkosaverse, Dreamweaver's Dilemma. Hello, fellow Vorkies. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at thevorecastpodcast at gmail.com or send me a message on Instagram at The Vorecast, all one word. That's T-H-E-V-O-R-C-A-S-T. Please rate, review, like, follow, and or subscribe to The Vorecast on whatever podcast platform you use. Thanks, and always remember, forward momentum. So, uh, according to Ellen B. herself, uh, this was the story, Dreamweaver's Dilemma, was uh, the first thing she wrote as a attempt to become a professional writer and take her writing seriously. And it also just happens to be the very first installment in our series. And uh, so, yeah, like I said, it really gives us uh, some insight. And even though the uh, books weren't exactly written chronologically, we you know might be able to glean some insight as we read along throughout the series and watch uh, LMB develop as a writer. So in that uh, spirit of that, Let's take a look at the very first sentence of the story. In fact, uh, let's read the very first uh, few sentences so we can really get a feel for a aspiring L&B's writing. Anais Rui, the feely dream composer, floundered up out of sleep, feeling like a sea creature being hauled out of deep water by a harpoon. She had the blurry thought that if the waking had been a transition in one of her own works, she would edit it out and the very next take. Her consciousness coming into sharp focus, she correctly identified the harpoon sensation as the musical chime of the bone. Okay, first three sentences there. So I'm not really going to be this nitpicky for the whole series. I'm doing this because specifically because this is like, you know, LMB's first uh, attempt. You know, obviously this is the result of many edits and, and so this is not like reading a rough draft, but you know, this is her first attempt, uh, according to her, at, at writing uh, seriously. And so uh, I, let's pick it apart a little bit. So the, the very first sentence here, it, it seems like it's trying to do too much. It, the common knowledge or the common idea, I guess, in writing is that you really want to have a good uh, first sentence that hooks in the reader, you know, something about it. Uh, and, and I'm not really sure exactly what part of this sentence is trying to do that. And maybe too many pieces or too many things are trying to do that. So we could be trying to intrigue the reader through bringing up this, the feely dream composer. Like, what is that? I mean, you could sort of figure it out from context, which is successful. Figuring things out from context is, is successful writing. You know, it's a little feely dream. You know, it's it's kind of a clunky name. And, and we'll talk about naming conventions um, a bit. But, you know, it, it gets the point across. Okay, feely dream. Yeah, I get it. I understand. She's a composer, right? Uh, but then we get into this uh, strange sort of like sea, uh, like, um, what are they called? Marine biology kind of, or fishing metaphors. I'm not sure. Like, for, so, and, and they kind of, they're, they're, they're a little off putting just at, at right out the gate. So, like, first of all, floundered up out of sleep. Like, yeah, I'm not sure if I would use floundered in this way. 
I mean, if I imagine floundering, what if a fish is floundering, it would, I visualize a fish like pulled out of water kind of flapping around on the uh, ground. And so, flou- I mean, I don't, that, I don't really relate that, what, you know, my perception of what that sensation would be like to any kind of feeling I've had while coming up to sleep, out of sleep, whether being surprised or annoyed or whatever. <clears throat> and then she says, Foundered up out of sleep, feeling like a sea creature being hauled out of deep water by a harpoon. So, and and then this to me is uh, also even further confusing because okay, is she? Um, so, so is is she the metaphor that the experience of waking in this situation was like the experience of a fish flopping around on the end of a harpoon because. I mean, if that's what she's trying to say here. That 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 I don't think that that makes much sense. That the act of a fi- yeah, that feel like a fish dying would be similar to any kind of waking sensation, no matter how jarring. It's just I'm not sure why she chose to use this, you know, the marine biology's fishing fishing metaphors. So second sentence here. She had the blurry thought that if the waking had been a transition in one of her own works, she would edit it out. In the very next take. Okay, so now we're once again using a sort of the the well, what what she's doing is very is a very good writing technique, which is she she's hiding exposition within the narrative of the story. But in this case, once again, it's just like really, it seems it seems like it's doing it too obviously, and because it just it doesn't seem natural that. It, it just doesn't seem like a natural thought to be having, you know. Usually if someone's startled from sleep or... I mean, I can't even tell if she's been startled from sleep or annoyed from sleep. Like, what? what's her mood? But whatever it is, it doesn't seem like it's a good thing. And it's it would be a very strange thought, I believe, to be like, oh, you know, like, it's like this. It's like, if if, if I if I woke up in the same fashion that that I was editing a podcast, I would cut that edit out it just does not seem it's just it's odd but what she's trying to do is furthermore flesh out who this person is what she, what her business is feely dream composer and that involves you know some sort of uh, creative process uh, with editing all right so then we go back in the third sentence here we go back to more fishing metaphor her consciousness her consciousness coming into sharp focus okay she correctly identified the harpoon sensation as the musical chime of the vone. So, so here she's confirming that her waking from sleep was somehow similar to being harpooned. I mean, I guess she's trying to say it was startling, you know, unpleasant feeling, but it's it seems too much and too confusing. Uh, her, you know, her writing style hasn't been established at this point to. You know, anyway, so, so I know, I know this is a lot and I know, I know it's, you know, right off the bat, I'm sorry, Alan B for listening, <laughs> that I'm really giving you a lot of shit here on just the first three sentences of your book. But, um, I, I think that this story does get off to a rough start and it gets way better. It does get real good. And I'm not really going to do this for sentence by sentence. I promise. <laughs> Let, let's uh, also for the first time, uh, consult with our reference materials here, uh, and, uh, check this name. Anais Rui, spelled A-N-I-A-S, uh, second, uh, last name, R-U-E-Y, uh, Anais Rui, that's how I'm reading it, so let's uh, reference that uh, to the pronunciation guide in the back of this co- compilation. Okay, and things are listed last name uh, for proper names first, so here we are in the R section, Rui Anais. Okay, so right away, this is this is interesting. Uh, there's two. She offers two separate pronunciations for the last name. One is Ray, R A Y, or R U H R U R A E R A E R U H. Do you pronounce that R U or R A? Hmm. Uh, they, they, they be, it would be useful to to use. I don't know if these are the proper phonetic. Uh, um, you know. Uh, well, I, I know there's some sort of system for writing words out phonetically that's like standardized, and I don't know if this is it. Um, but ru e ru a, so re or ra a, 
Huh, interesting. And then, Anias. Uh, Anias. All right, so Anias Rae. Look at that. Wow, I'm so happy that I looked this up, so now I won't be mispronouncing this. Um, uh, oh, and then there's also a little supplement here. Uh, Dreamweaver, uh, author of The Triad, Feely Dreams, a struggling artist. And then there's also a little reference to where uh, this character's from. DD, I'm going to assume that means Dreamweaver's Dilemma. All right, so back to the plot. Man, uh, you know, Alan B. tried to put so much into this first paragraph. So here we go. She knew only one man with the moral strength to ignore the bone. At the moment, it seemed his most admirable trait. As it continued to ding and Ainley, she regretfully gave up the desire to emulate him, and, in spite of the certainty in her heart that curiosity was more likely to be punished than rewarded, croaked, answer, and pulled up the screen to her face. Okay. So, um... The reason I wanted to talk about this is, I I don't want to spoil the rest of the story, but you know th this is obviously you know what what she's doing here. Once again, in her first paragraph, she's trying to uh, kind of establish a little uh, setup and payoff for an important character later, but it kind of fails to really uh, intrigue me. I mean, yeah, uh, about that character, and and because I'm because there's, <laughs> there's so much going on. Uh, in this very first paragraph, the kind of reference, the, the heavy-handed reference to some other character and some, you know, character, specific character trait uh, of that character. Um, it, it, you know, I see what she's doing technically uh, as, a, as a writer, which is the setup and payoff thing, but uh, d didn't need to happen here. Um, and I think... I think I think the whole ignoring the phone thing it just gets a little too much. It's it's not a strong enough character trait to really be defining for this guy uh, that we're gonna meet soon enough. Um, th that it has to be referenced <laughs> uh, a few times actually in the in the story. But maybe maybe Ellen B was dealing with her own frustrations with people not answering the phone or something. <laughs> it came came out through the story. Okay, so let's just start jumping around to the uh, the summary of, of what's going on. So, Anais is woken. Uh, in some fashion, some unpleasant fashion, <laughs> similar to being harpooned, apparently, um, by her uh, agent uh, slash uh, some sort of business associate that to do with her occupation of feely dreams, Helmut Gonzalez. And then we, we also put a kind of place, Rio de Janeiro's most successful feely dream distributor. Okay, so we've established that there's some kind of, you know, financial business arrangement here. She's has some sort of she's engaged in some sort of professional activity in this world there's there's obviously commerce involved in this world you know we we can't we can't we have no we can't assume anything really right so what she's doing is letting us know giving us subtle hints in, in an actually increasingly more subtle way <laughs> uh, about what's going on in our world here so uh, Rio de Janeiro exists okay so we're on earth we are um, you know and this this is where we get to some real subtlety, right? And, and or maybe I'm just exposing my own biases here, right? But when you place some sort of scientific, futuristic technology um, in a uh, what is commonly thought to be a kind of developing country in modern times, and this is in the 80s, I can't imagine uh, Brazil was doing much better socially back then than they are now. It it adds a further level of intrigue. Like uh, I remember in Heinlein, I believe they also lived in uh, like a tropical country in, in Starship Troopers. Um, you know, and and the description of their society that existed in this what in the modern you know in the context of the person who's reading modern time was. It adds a certain other level of storytelling. It's like oh, so much so, so much social change must have happened is in, in, in this, in this uh, future, futuristic world so, so that uh, this story could take place in this, in this place. So uh, that's a kind of subtle and very, very interesting choice she's made. Rio de Janeiro's most successful Feely Dream distributor snapped into focus on screen. And then we get a description of him. He's sort of fat uh, and, uh, I guess, a uh, boisterous guy. And, and we're, you know, we get a kind of stereotypical slimy uh, <laughs> sort of uh, entertainment industry 
type person. We get a little more insight into uh, Anais's kind of character uh, as she uh, answers the phone. Yeah, what is it? Anais said with all the ungraciousness she could muster. It's the first of the month, Anais, replied Gonzalez, frowning right back. Where is it? Are you going into one of your empresario phases again, she inquired, attacking the flank. It, th this is also classic uh, uh, Bujold. So, <laughs> to, coin a, to coin a catchphrase, classic Bujold. Um, she really like likes to mm, add modifiers after, uh, and, and description, descriptions uh, after dialogue. You know, the... I read once in Stephen King's uh, book about writing that this is not actually the preferred way to um, to, to to describe things using adverbs. Um, although I don't know, did, were there many adverbs there? Yes, there are. She loves that. She she loves uh, the ly adverb. But in those examples, there weren't uh, technically ly adverbs. But she does love to add those on after dialogue, and. Um, you know, it, it does bother me because I see what, what King was talking about there. It's just like a little clunky. But because she commits to it so much, it really becomes what what could be called classic Bujold. And um, so, you know, let's roll with it. Oh, and, and uh, just uh, if you, if, if you uh, are looking for a, a really interesting book on writing, uh, I, um, Stephen King's uh, book, and I, I can't recall the name of it now, um, Alexa. What's Stephen King's book about writing? Here's something I found on the web. According to wikipedia.org, on writing, a memoir of the craft is a memoir by American author Stephen King. Yep. Alexa, stop. Okay, so it is called On Writing. Um, and what's so interesting about it is that uh, he has a quite a profound perspective ch uh, change towards the end of the book because uh, I guess as he was writing this book, he it was before and after his horrible um, car accident or when he was hit, hit by a car um, and uh, yeah it really just profoundly changed him in his writing and, and I know we're getting, going off topic here but uh, I, I, I preferred uh, pre-car accident heavy drug use <laughs> Stephen King I don't know um, okay uh, so back on topic here so so far we have Anais being woken from a dream by a phone call from Helmet. He, uh, they, we've established that they have uh, it, kind of a um, quippy, I guess. I, I, you know, she's sort of like the original queen of quip as well. You know, like her dialogue style. It is very, I mean, this is from the 80s, and, and a lot of her stuff is from the 90s, but it all, you know, it, it does, like, seem more common... It, it does seem sort of derivative in a, in a way because uh, we're so used to this uh, with, with all the Josh Whedon stuff in the Marvel Universe and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and then even, sadly, in the Star Wars Universe. Um, but this quippy kind of dialogue, uh, you know, th this is from far... And, and this is not the first time we're going to encounter, like, what something that might seem derivative but was actually, you know, thought up by uh, Bujold before her. Uh, L and B before that, you know, or originally. So, Anais owes. Uh, we're, we're really taking our time here, folks. Anais, uh, Anais owes uh, Helmet um, a sequel to uh, a very successful feely dream that she had created uh, called Triad, and Helmet has paid her the advance on the sequel and expecting. Um, you know, delivery of the product is understandably upset. Here we go. It's not finished yet, is it? He asked rhetorically, interpreting her reply with depressed correctness. Does signing a contract mean anything to you, or is it just social pastime like sex? Oh, nasty, said Anais appreciatively. She sighs. How I long for the olden days when people could say, it's in the mail, it's in the mail. We live in an uncivilized age, Helmet. So, so this is, <laughs> see, this is, this is interesting because this, this sort of, it's in the mail thing. Like, so she is envisioning a time when the physical mail was the last, uh, communication, you know, long distance communication system. And at the time this was the most current, you know, <laughs> in the eighties, 
you know, there, there's no email or any kind of, you know, there's fax machines, um, but uh, I guess those weren't, <laughs> that, that, that wasn't considered, uh, you know, equivalent. So, um, yeah, so she, she, she did not anticipate email, and therefore somebody living in the future, it, seem, it does actually seem, from our perspective, living now, 2022, it doesn't seem, it actually doesn't seem likely that she would reference snail mail as, you know, the good old days, really. Uh, or that she would even know about the trope of things being lost in the mail. That's really my gripe. Is she, how would she know about that trope? Why does that still exist in popular culture? I mean, I mean, could you use that? Could you use that reference that's lost in the mail now and really ha- have it make as much sense as it would even, you know, back in the eighties uh, to to somebody born in the last uh, twenty years? You know, they probably would not understand the significance. Um, nitpicking, I know, but here, you know, what, what, I guess, I guess that's what's happening. Uh, also, a little more character development here. Obviously, Anais is uh, not afraid of, you know, raunchy humor. She claims that she actually did work on it, but uh, erased it. And the reason Anais gives is, I hate sequels. I'm tired of the subject. Garbage. How can you get tired of romance? He objected forthrightly. Oh, there he goes. There's an L-Y on. Besides, you're the one who makes so much noise about being a professional. So go to work like one. You don't find me in the sack at 10 in the morning when there's work to be done. My creditors don't put up with excuses instead of payments. So we're going back and forth a lot here, just sort of quipping, kind of like this playful dialogue that, you know, Bujold loves to do. The point of this dialogue is that we're establishing that Anais is feeling some kind of dissatisfaction with her work or with her assignment, a little ennui and, um, what the Helmet and I eventually settle on is that Helmet is now going to start withholding her royalties from her previous work until he received the sequel to Triad, putting Anais in somewhat of a dilemma, a creative dilemma, I suppose. There, you will see there will be many dilemmas in the story. So the, the name is apt, I suppose, and that is that she has to begin to try and create some work because she needs to get paid. And then we also get uh, kind of a, a prototype here of oh, some of LMB's personal writing style coming through, most of which I, I adore, some of which I have issues with, and we'll touch on those when they come up. But uh, like this, these kinds of, I don't know, soliloquies of, of hate, I guess you could call them, but here's a good one. All right, so here we, we get Anais has just finished talking with Helmet. She is expressing that she uh, understands, you know, internally she's telling that she understands why he's doing this, uh, but at, nevertheless, nevertheless, she indulged herself for a few minutes in a slanderous reverie upon his manners, morals, and genes. Now, yeah, it doesn't seem like much, but but there's something in that sentence that uh, resonates to me. To me, having read many of Ellen B's novels, that that this is quintessential her here, <laughs> and and we'll hear a lot more kind of snarky comments throughout the, the, the series, which I love. Okay, so Anais uh, gets dressed. She gets up reluctantly. We get some description uh, of her apartment and, and of the city she lives in. She dressed carelessly, dialed herself a large mug of coffee, and seated herself at her work table. Beyond, through the window, she could rest her eyes in distance among the jumbled geometries of the cityscape, backed by a glittering glimpse of the sea. The view reminded her that the position of her apartment was something for which she paid a premium. So she took a moment to call up a statement of her current financial status on the phone screen. Okay, so now we see that, uh, yes, she does need to, you know, she has no money. The Her agent helmet does, in fact, have this leverage over her. Oh, and then we kind of get first interesting uh, piece of future tech. So let's hear how LMB describes it. So now we're talking about Anais beginning work on her new feely dream. She settled more comfortably in the chair and unwound the pair of leads to her very expensive dream synthesizer, a neat black box about the size of an antique paperback book. After five years of slowly growing success in the creation of feely dreams, she had just finished paying for it entirely with proceeds from her work. This was a point of pride bordering on passion for her, which she looked forward to bringing up in her next one upmanship contest with her ex fiance her ex-guardian aunt, and any other unbelievers from her past. 
She put a fresh master cartridge in it and attached the leads to the small silvery metal circles set flush with her skin on each temple. Closing her eyes, she prepared to concentrate. Okay, so we see that this profession that she is in requires some sort of surgical alteration and implantation. That, and, that, and that it is storytelling technique not only says a lot about her and also from the from some of the character description in this paragraph we see that she sort of has a chip on her shoulder so not only says something about her that she's willing to have a surgical procedure done to sort of you know she's strongly motivated to pursue this career so there must be something to you know something says that must say something about her but also it involves the world building where where maybe something like attaching leads to how, how in some way some way through the skull to the areas of the brain that generate all of the uh, components of a feely dream that this sort of surgery is so commonplace that uh, I guess I guess it was ex the box was expensive it says it's expensive but she's able to pay it off with her own work it can't it can't be prohibitively expensive you know it would be maybe like paying off the cost of you know, this microphone and, and, you know, this microphone inputs and, you know, uh, stuff that I bought to, to do the podcast. And, you know, so it's like, it's an investment. It's not like, you know, not everyone just has a couple hundred bucks lying around to, to buy podcasting equipment. You don't even need to spend that much, honestly. I mean, um, you could do it with your phone, uh, as many people did and still do. Um, but the point is that, let's say, 20 years ago, buying this kind of equipment to record something that sounds this good, you know, uh, would have been prohibitively expensive, and you would have needed a, you know, a corporate entity behind you to, to you know, finance that kind of purchasing or some mat vast windfall from, so anyway, uh, it's a, it's a story, it's a world, it's also a world building and we're going to see that uh, LMB is so good at combining these elements and becomes better and better at it over time. So it's, it's just so subtle and, and the world just expands in your mind from context. And then uh, we go into a kind of interesting interlude where we see her trying to compose uh, this feely dream for her, her the sequel. So here, here we go. Let's just go through it. Interiorly, she began to construct a scene. Viewed from within the body of her female protagonist, she carefully marshaled her emotions, devotion, delight, and fear at the sight of her hero. Her male protagonist entered the room of the dream. In riding dress, he was tall and bronzed and muscular and handsome, with even white teeth and an irresistible masculine aroma of sweat, scented soap, leather, and horses. His presence held an overpowering sexual aura like an electric charge, boosted by the fact that he was obviously in a towering rage. So, he grunted out in a vibrant, penetrating bass voice, this is how you repay my trust. And and it's interesting that, that we, so we kind of understand all the elements of what goes into the feely dream but for, through this description. So there's some sort of, some sort of, must be some sort of, feeling of gender, what it is to be a gender, since she points out it's a female protagonist body, um, and, you know, all the feelings that, that, that scent is involved, that all sensations can be represented in, in this format, um, and, and then we see how it starts to go awry, she loses contr the emotional control of the character, and even though she set this up as sort of your stereotypical, you know, romance cover novel, <laughs> Uh, romance novel cover scene um, right away it goes off the rails and her protagonist is not romantic but uh, angry she then tries again uh, things go off the rails again and after that point she receives another phone call the phone chimed reprieved she answered it a man she did not know with oily black hair and an inadequate chin appeared on the screen Miss Rui he began politely my name is Rudolph Kinsey. I wonder if I may make an appointment to speak with you on a matter of business. Okay, so now we start to understand what is the trajectory of this story. Our character, Anais Ruiz, is a creative. 
She is involved in the creation of Feely Dreams, which is some sort of virtual reality sensory simulator. She does this through the use of her little black box that has uh, integrated into somehow some sort of subdermal wiring going on in her brain. And she is the, in the dilemma of an artistic dilemma, <laughs> at this point in the story at least, uh, and a financial dilemma, which is that she needs money. She doesn't want to work on the promised project to receive that money. And now we have the introduction of a new character from the description, probably not a good guy, <laughs> and possibly to offer a solution out of this particular dilemma. And so let's pick it up at that point uh, on episode two of the Vorecast. Oof, man, I, I gotta tell you, I've been uh, working myself up to do this for many months. Uh, you know, buying the equipment, buying the books, reading them, rereading them, writing an outline trying to record it with the outline, then realizing I couldn't ad-lib that well, and so I needed to write a script. Uh, so much procrastination, but we did it. We're here, and i just uh, really like to thank you all in advance. I'm sure at some point uh, another recording of me will give you some kind of contact information to send any emails, comments, or questions. So please, I do encourage you to do that. Oh, and I also want to um, just give a quick shout-out to uh, the Lubber's Hole podcast, which was the initial inspiration for me to do this podcast. And so thanks, guys. Thanks for all the great work. And I, I, um, I hope uh, you know I can have as much success as you guys have had. And um, uh, so until the next time, I will see you uh, on the other side of the wormhole nexus.